You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Park back narco-terrorism posing threat in Jammu and Kashmir. Minorities continue to face persecution under Park's blasphemy laws. And terror groups enjoying greater freedom in Afghanistan. Let's begin the show with India's Jammu and Kashmir, where the security forces are facing the challenge of narco-terrorism. Since the past few months, large quantity of banned drugs have been recovered by the Law Enforcement Department in various districts of the Union Territory. Security agencies believe that the money from these drugs is being used by Pakistan-backed outfits to carry out terror-related activities. We have a report. Narco-terror is becoming a big threat not only in terms of sustenance of terrorist activities but also in terms of its impact on youth in Jammu and Kashmir. The recent months have witnessed major narcotic smuggling attempts in India's Union Territory from Pakistan. Just a few days ago, security forces seized 45 kilograms of heroin at two separate border areas of Jammu and Kashmir. In the first incident, border security force neutralized three Pakistani intruders in the Samba district and recovered 36 kilograms heroin worth millions of rupees. This was the fourth narcotic smuggling bit foiled by the BSF troops along the border in the Jammu region this year. On the same day, Jammu and Kashmir police seized 9 kilograms of heroin in Kashmir's Uri. सर्वलेंस इक्विपमेंट है उसमें कुछ मूवमेंट पकड़ी गई जिसके तहत जो फॉरवर्ड ड्यूटी पॉइंट्स पर जो ट्रूप्स तैनात थे उनको अलर्ट किया गया और पाकिस्तान की तरफ से जब फेंस के नजदीक वो लोग पहुंचे तो ट्रूप्स को कुछ दिखाई दिए हरकत चैलेंज किया गया और उसके बाद जो जो कार्रवाई की गई उसमें तीन स्मगलर्स जो पाकिस्तान की तरफ से आए थे उनको न्यूट्रलाइज किया गया और सर्च के दौरान 36 पैकेट जो नारकोटिक्स के हैं वो पकड़े गए एक पैकेट लगभग एक किलो के आसपास का है The seizure of narcotics in several parts of Union territory in the last few years gives the impression that there are multiple networks of narcotic trade. According to Jammu and Kashmir Police, in 2020, over 152 kilograms of heroin and 49.7 kilograms of brown sugar were recovered from different parts of the Union territory. In the same year, the police had registered 1,132 cases and arrested 1,672 people involved in drug trafficking. Most share of terror funding in Kashmir emanates from across the border is generated through narco financing, which comes from the control of narcotic trade in the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. The idea behind the drugs terrorism nexus is to make terrorism a self-propelled and self-financed business. Overground workers of terrorist organizations in border areas works as peddlers to lure youths, especially teenagers, to consume drugs. They are in tandem with the handlers in Pakistan and make use of information technology as well as social media to communicate with each other and get the drug assignment on the LOC before sending it to other parts of the valley. The requirement of having the complete surveillance of the border through drones and other means that is a 24 into 7 into 365 all weather surveillance because we have seen that the adversary that is Pakistan, Pakistan ISI has been using drones 
and other material and other uh, source, sources also to send in the narcotics. The modus operandi is that you drop these narcotics at the border and then the couriers from India would pick it up. So once the drones are monitoring 24-7 the borders, the moment they see this such sort of uh, activity, they can monitor it and then catch hold of all those who are coming to pick up this consignment. Narco-terrorism is an integral component of Pakistan's state sponsorship of cross-border terrorism, used so as to fund and conduct asymmetric warfare against its neighbours. As per the NCB report, more than 25% of the money spent on terrorist activities in India by Pakistan's spy agency, the ISI, comes from the narcotics drug trade. The use of narcotics for terror funding by the ISI is being seen as a trick to avoid being traced back. But to its much disappointment and humiliation, even the narco terror network of Islamabad stands exposed now as the Indian security forces have upped their arms against Pakistan's sponsored terrorism at all fronts. Pakistan is among the countries where blasphemy is punishable by death. In many instances, the accused are killed by mobs before legal proceedings even begin. Often it is the member of religious minorities who end up being accused of blasphemy. Recently, an innocent Hindu teacher sentenced to life imprisonment over blasphemy charges in Pakistan. A report. A video on social media shows female students of Red Mosque in Islamabad practicing how to behead a person accused of blasphemy. They are free to do whatever they want as they have acquired an open license to kill non-Muslims in Pakistan. This open license is draconian blasphemy law. Now the country's never-ending nightmare of blasphemy law has a new victim, a Hindu school principal, Northern Lal. He has been sentenced to life imprisonment by a local court over charges of blasphemy in Pakistan's southern Sindh province. Lal was arrested in September 2019 after an intermediate student of the public school in Ghotki district alleged that the teacher had committed blasphemy against the prophet. Many parts in Ghotki saw a violence outbreak on the night the case was registered. As the news spread, Fanatic Muslim men attacked the Sacho Satram Dham temple in district. They ransacked the temple, damaged its idols, and battered its walls, and the entire Ghotki town was later shut down. This student, who had accused Northern of blasphemy charges, was later seen with Mia Mitu, the extremist cleric behind the forced conversion of Hindu girls. This kind of uh imprisonment for the life for this uh, Hindu teacher and accusing him of blasphemy is absolutely against the fundamental human rights. This is something that uh, a government that Pakistan or especially Imran Khan tried to vouch for the Naya, Naya Pakistan in which minorities will have all the freedom. Of course, nobody has the right to uh, denigrate any religion or religious symbols, but at the same time, misinterpreting anything is also equally dangerous. And that's what leads to volatility in the society. And I think that Pakistan uh, is going and Talibanizing itself uh, to this extent. Northern Lal is one of about 1,500 Pakistanis charged with blasphemy over the past three decades. Earlier on, eight-year-old Hindu boy was also charged under controversial laws. In Pakistan, blasphemy suspects are often killed without a second thought, thus meaning that chances of a fair and free trial are almost absent due to the threat posed to judges 
and the defendants. Since 1990, several people have been murdered by mobs and vigilantes over allegations of insulting Islam. Those who defended the accused were killed too, including two high-level politicians who publicly opposed the death sentence of Asia Bibi, a Christian woman convicted for verbally insulting the Prophet Muhammad. While Asia Bibi was lucky to be freed, not everyone meets the same fate. Just a few days ago, a Sri Lankan national who worked as a general manager at a local factory in Pakistan's Sialkot city was tortured, murdered and then set on fire by a mob that had accused him of blasphemy. Well, the world is aware uh, about the situation in Pakistan uh, with regard to the lack of all religious freedoms, especially for minorities. There have been umpteen number of cases. Human rights groups have all identified these problems and have been able to effectively convey it to the world community. But Pakistani government and the pe people of Pakistan must rise and see to it that their country remains a modern country. It's very important. Modernity and religion are not contradictory. But this kind of uh, behavior uh, will attract the global attention and eventually a global sanction and will not be conducive to Pakistan's growth as a modern nation. Tragic killings in Pakistan over blasphemy accusations are not just about extrajudicial vigilantism. The country has the world's second strictest blasphemy laws after Iran, according to the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. People accused of blasphemy face a grueling struggle to establish their innocence and even after acquittal, they face threats to their life. Therefore, Pakistan's bloodthirsty blasphemy law needs to be repealed immediately. In a wheeled attack on Pakistan's nefarious designs of fomenting terror, India urged the United Nations to take note of the terrorist groups disguising as humanitarian organizations. India said, the tactic employed by the terror-backing countries not only appropriates the identity of the dreaded terror outfits, but also provides them a safe route to evade sanctions regime laid under 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee. It also enables them to fundraise millions of dollars that are eventually used to carry out their diabolical missions in other countries. Since its foundation in 1990 till 2019, even a dozen page internet scrutiny would not have shaken any innocent's belief, or to say it more precisely, any Pakistani's belief that Falai Insanit Foundation was anything other than a magnanimous charity organization. Images of its volunteers helping people in distress would further consolidate his faith. Based out of Lahore, the organization was involved in several human welfare activities before Islamabad was cornered by the international community to proscribe it. Falai Insaniyat Foundation was floated by the same Hafiz Saeed who has blood of hundreds of innocents on his hand. It had two primary objectives. One, to create a humanized facade in order to provide a cover to lashkar e taiba terrorist operations against India and others, and two, to raise trouble-free funds to sustain the same terrorist movement. This is just one example of how the terrorist organizations survive and expand their network. India, which has long borne the brand of terrorism, coming exclusively from across its border, wants United Nations to pull the plug on this methodology. Speaking at the UN Security Council open debate related to sanctions, India apprised and warned the global community of this rampant exercise where terrorist groups were coming up new and so-called humanitarian guise to prevent sanctions while keeping their missions intact. It is imperative that sanctions do not impede legitimate humanitarian requirements. 
However, it is important to exercise due diligence while providing humanitarian carve-outs, especially in cases where terrorism finds safe havens. There have been examples of terrorist groups taking full advantage of humanitarian carve-outs, making a mockery of sanctions regimes, including that of the 1267 Sanctions Committee. There have also been several cases of terrorist groups in our neighborhood, including those listed by this council, rebranding themselves as humanitarian organizations to evade these sanctions. These terrorist organizations use the umbrella of the humanitarian space to raise funds, recruit fighters, and even use human shields. Under the garb of the humanitarian cover provided by such exemptions, these terrorist groups continue to expand their terror activities in the region and beyond. Due diligence, therefore, is an absolute must. India reiterated its belief that terrorism in one part of the world is a threat to the peace and security of the entire world. It also said that apart from just condemning the acts, the response of all the countries should be unified and unequivocal. While taking a swipe at Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, India's permanent representative at the UN said they were countries who egolize terrorists. Pakistani Prime Minister Khan had called Osama bin Laden a martyr in his own country's parliament. And when a Prime Minister himself holds such an opinion about a terrorist, only one wonders what the country's state policy would be like. New Delhi has time and again expressed its concern that Pakistan provides tactic support to international radical organizations and has been nurturing others in its own backyard by exploiting the loopholes in the current system of sanctions. As a country that has long borne the brunt of cross-border terrorism, including the 2008 Mumbai terror attack and the 2016 Pathan Court terror attack, with victims of both these dastardly acts yet to get justice, India is acutely aware of the human cost of terrorism and remains fully committed to bringing the perpetrators of these attacks to justice. We reiterate our firm belief that terrorism in one part of the world is a threat to peace and security of the entire world. And therefore, while condemning these acts, these attacks, our response should be unified and unequivocal. We should not forget the fact that even after 20 years of September 11 attacks, we have leaders who, without any remorse, continue to defend Osama bin Laden as a martyr. New Delhi has been engaging with everybody around the world in order to curb the menace of terrorism. It has urged everybody to be on the same page when it comes to combating a common enemy. However, it has also been seeking reforms when it comes to working methods of subsidiary bodies of the Security Council. It said that the archaic and opaque methods must now be open, transparent and credible. India wants these regimes to remain under constant review so that they keep pace with the changing situation on the ground. An extra push comes in the backdrop of Pakistan's intensified multi-layered efforts at infiltrating terrorists into Indian territory, denting harmony by stoking fanatic passions and flaring separatist agenda by working overtime to indoctrinate youths of Kashmir. Although they have been responded with an iron fist, Indian aim is to bring a perennial state of peace in the country and around the world. And for all that, it has been demanding an integrated response to terrorism, no matter where it is emanating from. Terror groups enjoy greater freedom in Afghanistan than at any time in recent history. And there are no signs that the Taliban leadership has taken steps to limit the activities of foreign terrorists in the war-torn country. This has been claimed by a new UN report which also says that the dreaded Islamic terrorist groups aims to position itself as the chief rejectionist force in Afghanistan. Take a look. The Taliban first ruled Afghanistan from 1996 to 2001 and were ousted for harboring al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden for masterminding the 9-11 terrorist attacks in the US. In a February 2020 deal that spelled out the terms of the US troop withdrawal, the Taliban had promised 
to fight terrorism and deny terrorist groups a safe haven in Afghanistan. Security experts, however, believe that there are no recent signs that the de facto rulers in Afghanistan have taken steps to limit the activities of foreign terrorist fighters in the country. A new UNSC report has revealed that Al-Qaeda retains a presence in Afghanistan, in the provinces of Ghazni, Helmand, Kandhar, Nimruz, Paktika and Zabul, where the group fought alongside the Taliban against the ousted government. The report has also claimed that the slain Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden's son visited Afghanistan last year. It further revealed that Amin Muhammadul Haq Sam Khan, who coordinated security for bin Laden, returned to his home in Afghanistan in late August last year. The 22-page report prepared by UNSC Group that monitors counter-terrorism sanctions targeting Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State has questioned the Taliban's commitment under the Doha Agreement of preventing international terrorist threats from having a foothold in Afghanistan. Taliban has no interest in taking any steps against Al-Qaeda or other organizations because at the end of the day, these organizations do not fight with one another. The earlier Afghan regime had a problem with Al-Qaeda, had a problem with ISIS and therefore they were confronting these two organizations uh, and they were also confronting Taliban. So the rest of the world was fed with this fiction that if the Taliban was to take over, they would be able to control both Al-Qaeda and uh, ISIS. But the fact remains, Al-Qaeda has for a long time been a partner of the Taliban. So why should Taliban go against these Al-Qaeda elements? It doesn't stand to reason at all. The Taliban government has rejected the report but it is very difficult for Taliban rulers to deny another claim of UN report that Islamic State Khorasan is taking advantage of the turmoil in the country. The report has said that Islamic State Khorasan or ISISK is recruiting fighters from the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement and the Turkestan Islamic Party among other foreign terrorist groups. It aims to position itself as the chief rejectionist force in Afghanistan and to expand into neighboring Central and South Asian countries. The UN member states have also assessed that the strength of the ISISK has increased from earlier estimates of 2,200 fighters to now approaching 4,000 following the release by the Taliban of several thousand individuals from prison. ISISK, a US-designated foreign terrorist organization, has been responsible for some of the deadliest attacks in the region in recent years, massacring civilians in Afghanistan. The group had claimed responsibility for the Kabul airport attack that killed at least 185 people, including 13 US service members supporting evacuation operations. Recently, the US announced a reward of up to $10 million for information on leader of organization Sanaullah Ghaffari and those responsible for attack on the airport. This uh, fact that they have to announce a reward for information shows how big the failure of US policy has been in Afghanistan. The United States basically let the Afghan uh, government down and it has been going on for a long period of time. It did not put pressure on those elements, particularly Pakistan, which was helping the Taliban. Of course, the Afghan government itself did not help matters by becoming corrupt and by rigging elections. But that's another matter altogether. The policy of the United States in Afghanistan has been a complete failure. To expect that once you let the Taliban take over, that your problems would be solved is now shown to be a failure that you have to basically announce a reward for information. The UN member states are concerned that if Afghanistan descends into further chaos, some Afghan and foreign violent extremists may shift allegiances to Islamic State. The conflict landscape of Afghanistan is diverse and multifaceted. 
characterized by rivalries between jihadist groups and competition for recruits. The impacts go beyond the borders of Afghanistan. The events in Afghanistan therefore continue to demand great attention. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. Subscribe Tag TV YouTube channel and press the notification button.